welcome to an all-new season of Pick 6 Movies. You know, the podcast where every season we pick six movies, all related to a single theme, discuss how and why the movie was made, and then to cap it all off, we give you a full review of the movie from start to finish just to see if it's any good. Now, if we've met before, I apologize. I'm really terrible with names. I'm Chad Cooper, and my co-host, Mr. Bo Ransdell, he'll be here in just a few minutes to join me as we help get this movie podcast moving along. So, how have you been? Terrible? Me too. What have you been up to recently? That's crazy. I've been doing nothing and sitting around in my house watching endless hours of television as well. We have so much in common, you and me. I knew we'd hit it off the instant we met. Hey, let me ask you a question. Have you ever watched a TV show and thought, man, I'd really like to see this show, but with different actors, in a movie theater, where I have to pay actual money to see it. Well, you know what? You're in luck because this season is featuring six major motion pictures that were all inspired by television series. And we've cleverly titled this season As Seen on TV. This is episode one featuring a little movie called The Avengers. No, it's not the big over the top one that you're thinking of. This one is from 1998, and it stars Rafe Fiennes and Uma Thurman and Sean Connery. It's got Eddie Izzard in it. Do you even know who these people are? Have you ever heard of the British television show The Avengers? You know what? I'm going to let you in on a little secret. I've never heard of the show either. We have so much in common, you and me. You know what? I knew we were going to hit it off famously the very first time you clicked play to listen to this podcast. And you know what? My co-host, Bo... He's always saying great things about you all the time. We both love you. You know what, speaking of, let's get him here to break down how this adaptation of The Avengers for the big screen paid homage to the quirky, sexy, small screen, spy-tastic television show that you and I have never heard of. Hey, Bo, take it away. Ah, England. The cradle of etiquette, the talisman of the civilized world, a powerhouse of finance, fashion, and entertainment. Why, thanks to research from this show, I learned that this here United States of America used to be owned by England, at least partly. I mean, ignoring all the people who lived here when English people arrived. But yeah, the good old US of A was part and parcel of the British Empire. A bunch of colonies that served under British rule until we decided to dump some tea in a harbor and thumb our noses at the King of England with a Declaration of Independence and a list of 27 grievances against the ground. You may, like me, be surprised to hear that we won that war. A few years later, when all the fighting settled down and England recognized the independence of the United States, the soon-to-be-quite-insane King George greeted John Adams as an ambassador and said, in a very English way, I was the last to consent to the separation, but the separation having been made and having become inevitable, I have always said, as I say now, that I would be the first to meet the friendship of the United States as an independent power. There was another war in the early 1800s, but we won that one too. And after that, we developed what has often been called a special relationship with the mother country. Winston Churchill coined that term. And what the notion boils down to is that England and the U.S. enjoy a diplomatic, financial, and military relationship that borders on the creepily close. We're like those cousins who meet for the first time at a family reunion and secretly hope we're not first cousins so the drunken groping after karaoke isn't, you know, illegal. We have a lot in common. Language, naturally. And that goes a long way considering nobody in this country is going around learning those fancy other languages like French and Spanish and Mandarin. We tend to share the same values, too, and celebrate our working classes. Much of our legal system is cribbed from England's. Likewise, our political system, though our Congress is way less fun than Parliament in the old country. Seriously, look up MPs behaving badly. MPs, of course, being Ministers of Parliament. I'll wait. That's a rabbit hole that can last for hours if you're anything like me. But here on Pick 6 Movies, we're not concerned with politics or finance or fashion. We want to be entertained. And turns out we stole a whole lot of our entertainment from merry old England too. And not just the stuff you think you know. Sure, there's the Beatles and the whole British new wave of music, or all those James Bond movies, put a pin in that for now, loyal listeners, or even the glut of baking shows where proper British people pronounce cupcakes with rosemary reductions glorious. 
No, I mean the meat and potatoes, all-American, grade-A television that we grew up on. Or at least the knuckleheads on this show did. For example, did you know that Sanford and Son, a show that is referenced perilously often on this show, is actually a retelling of the British series Steptoe and Son? It didn't have African-American leads across the pond, but it's basically the same premise. How about some more 70s sitcoms? Three's Company, in which John Ritter pretends to be gay so he can live with two hot babes in an apartment, is based on a British show called Man of the House. Well, you say, surely the spinoff of Three's Company, The Ropers, is an American invention, what with its Norman Fell sniffing out fake homosexuals and all. Nope, that's just a show called George and Mildred that was a spinoff of the aforementioned Man of the House. Too Close for Comfort was real close to keep it in the family. And speaking of the family, All in the Family was a repackaged version of a show called Till Death Do Us Part. The most famous example may be The Office, which was a wildly successful BBC series that wound up being a wildly successful American show. Well, you say, loyal listener, the British are known for their dry wit. What Americans do best is drama. I contest what we do best is steel dramas. Big hits like House of Cards, Queer as Folk, Life on Mars, and Shameless are all directly lifted from British television. Okay, how about reality shows? You know, the dumb shit only ding-dong Americans would watch. Well, it turns out the English have just as many ding-dongs as we do, inventing popular shows like American Idol, called Pop Idol in the UK, Antique Roadshow, Cash Cab, Master Chef, Kitchen Nightmares, Junkyard Wars, known by the superior title Scrapyard Wars on the other side of the Atlantic, Undercover Boss, The X Factor, Dancing with the Stars, and I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here! And of course, game shows, from whose line is it anyway to who wants to be a millionaire and bunches more in between. Even a critical darling like Beep is really just a retelling of the British series The Thick of It, move from the halls of English Parliament to the White House. There's almost nothing that the English can't conceive that we won't swipe and spin with a little anti-English to make it walk and talk like a pure-blood American show. Well, almost none. There is one show I can think of that is so thoroughly British, there is almost no way to adapt it for an American audience. Its DNA is made up of tea times and cricket and stereotypically poor dentistry. No, not Doctor Who, you nerds. America took a swing at that one in 1996 as a Fox TV movie, with Eric Roberts as the villain The Master, and some of the old British doctors returning. But that's not what I mean. No, what I'm talking about is The Avengers. No, no, not that one. This one. The British TV show, produced by ABC, that's the Associated British Corporation, which first appeared in 1961. The first episode, called Hot Snow, replaced another television series with the amazing title of Police Surgeon. The first star of the Avengers, Ian Hendry, played the titular Police Surgeon. And while the show didn't work, people liked Ian Hendry. And so he made the short hop from one series to another in the exact same time slot. He plays Dr. David Keel, who joins forces with the mysterious investigator John Steed to take down a drug ring. Ian Hendry was the presumptive star of the show, but after a season of criminal investigations, Ian Hendry decided to leave the show. While that might spell doom for other programs, throughout the first season, the character of John Steed grew more and more critical. When production of the first season was cut short by a labor strike, Hendry jumped ship for a film career, and actor Patrick McNee, who played the proper John Steed, was promoted to series star. The second season tried out a few different partners for Steed including another doctor named Martin King, who was essentially Ian Hendry's character all over again, and he was out on the curb in pretty short order. Then there was Venus Smith, a nightclub singer who was thrown in with Steed a few times, and usually her episodes included a song or two to show off actress Julie Stevens' pipes. And then there was Dr. Tara Gale, as played by Honor Blackman. You may better know Honor Blackman as James Bond girl Pussy Galore. Yeah. That's a real name in the movies. I know. Anyway, Dr. Tara Gale was no nightclub singer. Word is that some of the scripts for the second season were already written, and rather than rewrite the episodes for the new female doctor, they let it rip, and rip it did. Tara Gale was older than most of the ingenues on television, by which I mean she was in her mid-30s, 
and had a penchant for leather outfits. Also, she didn't take any shit, and she was rarely depicted as anything less than Steed's equal. She was brash, smart, sexy, and as eager to mix it up with the evildoers as was Steed. By the third season of the show, Tara Gale was Steed's only companion. While standards disallowed any explicit discussion of the sexual relationship between Gale and Steed, there were certainly hints of it, and there was a patter between the characters, a genuine chemistry. And the show was still finding itself during this time, honing the characters and tone. Steed, who first appeared as a trench coat wearing gumshoe type, now wore tailored suits and a soon to be iconic bowler hat. His background, always mysterious, came more into focus, painting him as a secret agent who worked for an agency known as The Nutshell, and never without his trusty umbrella. By the way, all his clothes were designed by Pierre Cardin, and fashion was as much a part of the Avengers as anything else, another very swinging London characteristic that would define the show. While the tone began to reflect more modern times, Steed was the epitome of the English gentleman, and Tara Gale's more hip manners made great contrast for the characters. With her flashy attire and long boots, Honor Blackman became a fashion icon and sex symbol. And so, when it came time to make the fourth season, Honor Blackman was simply too big a star. She had pussies to galore, after all. And so she left the show for the big screen, torpedoing a proposed Avengers feature film in favor of something called, let me check my notes, Golden Finger. <laughs> And so, with Honor Blackman out and the Avengers a hot property, the daunting task of filling Blackman's kinky boots, no kidding, that was what they were referred to in a novelty song called Kinky Boots that featured both Patrick McNee and Honor Blackman, anyway, those boots had to be filled. Along the way, the success of the show garnered some interest from ABC, that's the American Broadcasting Company, who wanted to air the Avengers on primetime in the US. No adaptations, just the straight Avengers juice. And so, in March 1966, the Avengers hit American television. Only, it sort of didn't, but we'll get to that. Before they could make their American debut, the Avengers, note the plural title, was short an Avenger to the tune of one. The creators now had a handle on the vibe of the show, the character of John Steed, and the necessity for a powerful woman opposite him, and even made the transition from old multi-camera video production like you'd find with most sitcoms, to 35mm film in single camera setups that more closely replicated an honest-to-goodness movie. To match this more theatrical feel, they needed a match for John Steed, and in defining this new partner, the writers for the Avengers knew she'd need to be sexy and smart and fashionable. In short, she'd need what the writers called man appeal. As shorthand for this character trait, in scripts, they called her Samantha Peel, then Mantha, then just the letter M. M Appeal. This evolved into, of course, M Appeal. So they had a character all ready to go, but casting was tough. The spectacularly named Dodo Watts was casting director on the show, and she saw more than 60 actresses before they decided on the one and only M Appeal, actress Elizabeth Shepard? That's right, Elizabeth Shepard was M Appeal and actually filmed a couple of episodes before producers realized that there was something off in the chemistry between Patrick McNee and Shepard. And considering the electricity between Honor Blackman and McNee, nothing less than someone extraordinary would do. Dodo Watts pointed producers to a show called Festival, featuring an unknown but striking actress named Diana Rigg. Rigg was brought in to test screen opposite Patrick McNee, and the sparks flew. With the addition of Rig, the tone of the show shifted once more, and the verbal fencing of Emma Peel and John Steed became a centerpiece of the growing popularity of the Avengers. Like Honor Blackman, Diana Rigg became an overnight sensation and was admired for the often fetishy leather catsuits and overt sexuality of the character. She was coy, bright, sexual, adventurous, and every bit of match for Steed. Like Honor Blackman's Tara King, she was far more assertive and daring than almost any other female characters on television. She appeared in the fourth and fifth seasons, when the show transitioned from black and white in the fourth to color in the fifth, and made the big debut on American television. Remember that? While ABC, that's the American ABC, wanted a taste of the Avengers' success, they may not have known just what they were getting. 
like an episode entitled A Touch of Brimstone, in which Emma Peel ends the episode in a spike collar dressed like a dominatrix. And even if they were cool with the somewhat alternate sexuality of the show, they definitely weren't ready for the more explicit violence, more than appeared on American television usually. So The Avengers was dumped into a 10 p.m. time slot when all the kitties were in bed because The Avengers was a distinctly grown-up show, despite its frequent silliness and shrink-ray weirdness. When it went to syndication, CBS, another American broadcaster famous for being all-access now and showing all the television your grandma watches, they would air the show before 11.30 in the p.m. Not to mention how audaciously British the show was. This was a show never meant for American eyes, and the creators didn't bend an inch to make it more palatable for American viewers. It was what it was, and if you didn't like it, you could lump it. The show itself reached new highs during this period, when American audiences were squirming in their seats over its content. In addition to fetish dungeons, there were psychic warriors, man-eating plants, and killer robots. The characters even obliquely broke the fourth wall. It was clever, it was weirdly meta, and it was more than a touch kinky, and it was doomed not to last. We just don't deserve things this good, people. At the end of the fifth season, Diana Rigg left the show too. She felt the producers underpaid her, they had, and she wanted to follow Honor Blackman's path into the movies. She ended up being a Bond girl too, though she was the only one to ever put a ring on it, but more on that another season. For her send-off, Emma Peel met her replacement on a stairwell and told the incoming young agent, Tara King, as played by Linda Thorson, that her long-missing husband had been found. As a last piece of advice, Emma Peel tells the young agent, He likes his tea stood counterclockwise, gets in a Bentley, and drives away with her returned love. She and McNee famously were lifelong friends, and Rig herself is a great star who still works at the age of 82 as of this recording. Her most famous work is likely her turn as Olena Tyrell on Game of Thrones, a part she absolutely killed. She's also terrific opposite Vincent Price in Theater of Blood. Quick aside, you should watch Theater of Blood. Anyways, without Rig, the show continued another season, but it just wasn't the same. The show tried to shift back to a more realistic espionage tone, but after the campy joy of the two seasons before, it just felt wrong. There were highlights for sure, but nothing matched the sheer joy of the Rig and Blackman episodes, when all the cylinders were firing and there was just nothing else like it on television, here or abroad. One of the writers, Dennis Spooner, said, quote, It became a parody on itself almost, and you can only do that so long. In its time, the show had parodied everything from James Bond to Mission Impossible to The Dirty Dozen, and there were just no more worlds to conquer. In its final episode, Steed and Tara King accidentally launched themselves into space while sipping champagne. Now that's how you go out with style. And so the adventures were shelved. Seasons four through six made their way into American syndication, where it gained newfound cult status for its zaniness and sharp writing, but sadly, very little of the first season remains. Mostly bits and pieces of a few episodes, because the tape they used for filming the adventures was frequently recorded over for new shows. And that brings us to another American remake, this time that wholly British show, The Avengers. But we're not making some American photocopy television series, we're making a big budget, star-studded action movie. And who's in this movie? Sean Connery, James Bond himself, the bride from Kill Bill, Uma Thurman, the evil dickhead from Schindler's List, Ray Fiennes, even celebrated stand-up and legendary cross-dresser, Eddie Izzard. And behind the camera, Jerry Weintraub, producer of the Karate Kid movies and Oh God and those Ocean's Eleven remake movies, he's on board to shepherd this through production. And also, Hot Hand director Jeremiah Chechik is brought in to direct, just off of films like Christmas Vacation, see Season 4, Episode 2 of Pick 6 Movies for more on that one, and Benny and June, where Johnny Depp plays a mentally disturbed stalker. So how did this team of all-stars make a movie called One of the Worst Movies of All Time? A movie reviewers called the worst movie of the summer in 1998, stupefyingly awful and short but not short enough? According to Chechik himself, it's a real too many cooks situation. Jerry Weintraub loved the project and put it all together with Chechik at the helm. Meanwhile, Warner Brothers was in the midst of an upheaval as the entire upper management was turning over to new management. 
management, mind you, that had no interest in making a movie like The Avengers. For Weintraub and Chechik, they wanted to do a big screen adaptation of the tongue-in-cheek, campy, silly, incredibly British, and yes, kinky, series they so loved. Warner Brothers wanted a summer action movie. Fortunately, Jerry Weintraub was there to keep things on the rails and make sure the movie he and Chechik envisioned was the one that would make its way into cinemas the summer of 1998. Unfortunately, the executives who initially greenlit the movie as a silly, campy, kinky, British send-up were gone, leaving behind a new set of suits and ties who didn't want a thoroughly British movie on their slate. They wanted stuff blowing up. With no one in the upper echelons of Warner Brothers to support the movie, producer Jerry Weintraub and director Jeremiah Chechik were essentially removed from the post-production process after Chechik turned in a 115-minute cut of the movie. That cut was test-screened and audiences had no idea what to make of this weirdo throwback to the mod 60s of London and giant teddy bears having a meeting about weather machines. And so, studio editors went to work, carving the movie down to its current 89-minute runtime. Pretty sure they had what scientists call a real stinkeroo on their hands, Warner Brothers allowed no advanced critical screenings and released the Avengers on the public without a word of warning. It was, as before mentioned, a critical disaster. Not only that, the terrible word of mouth, on account of it being awful, put the box office in a tailspin and the movie would never recover its modest by today's standard $60 million budget. Chechik has never seen this version of his movie, only the longer one he cut. To him, he said, it's just too painful. He admits that maybe his cut wouldn't have been any better, or might not have been any more successful financially speaking, but it would have done good by his interpretation of the oddball series that spawned the movie in the first place. In fact, he has offered to recut the movie into his original vision, a director's cut of the Avengers, a Chechik cut, if you will, on his own dime. Just give me access to the footage, he says, and I can show the world what I'm meant to say. Sadly, Warner Brothers has expressed no interest in such a thing, but I'd give it a look just to see how close he actually came to capturing the goofy, snappy magic of the original show. But now, let's get Chad in here to talk about the weather with me as we call down the lightning for the 1998 misfire, ladies and gentlemen, peels and steeds, it's the Avengers. Hashtag release the Chechik cut. Welcome back to Pick 6 Movies. I am Bo Ranstell. With me, as always, the John Steed to Miami Appeal, because I get to wear the outfits. Chad Cooper. <laughs> Hello there, Bo. Hey, so this is the beginning of season 12. Season 12? Yeah, yeah, the, the dozen. <laughs> you want to play the dozens? The dozens is a game. Yeah, so this is our 12th season, and uh, this season we are calling As Seen on TV. We are. Uh, a season all about movies, what are adapted from television shows. Correct. And we are starting with uh, a television show that I genuinely like. I genuinely have never seen an episode of it. You said that, and I found that weird because when we were kids, before there was ever a Fox television, the what is now the Fox station in Nashville, Channel 17, WZTV in, channel, in, in Nashville. Mm -hmm. The UHF station. The UHF station, they would show old Avengers episodes in the afternoon. Then Avengers episodes I kind of caught up to later when it was on like A&E or something like that. I don't want to present myself as some sort of expert on the series. I know a little bit about the series thanks to some research and I've seen a handful of episodes. But in going back and doing research for this show, I started re-watching uh, some of those Diana Rigg episodes. And man, it is a super fun show. It is, it's very clever. It's very witty. It's very silly. Silly. This movie is none of those things, Bo. <laughs> it is not. There are moments watching this movie, which I've probably seen ah, three or four times at this point, mostly because of how short it is. And, and if you blink, you're like, oh shit, I accidentally watched all of the Avengers. <laughs> I didn't mean to. I don't even know that I can call this a movie. It's more of just a loosely strung together series of scenes that resembles a movie. Yes. As you heard in the introduction, this was a movie that was in its 
original version was almost two hours long. The version that we see is less than 90 minutes. Though there are intentionally plotless experimental student films that are easier <laughs> to follow and understand in comparison to this movie. You could argue that Koyana Skatsi, the visual film coupled with nothing but Philip Glass music, <laughs> is much more narrative in its structure than is the Avengers. <laughs> About halfway through this movie, I felt like I was watching this high-tech Alice in Wonderland wrapped around a lowbrow mystery, a CSI C.S. Lewis, if you will. There is an element of just like, so who the fuck is this? And what would just happen? I mean, we'll get into all that, but it really is one of the finest examples. Like, if, if listeners have ever heard us say, like, this just looks like somebody threw a movie into a blender and then just presented whatever came out of that disarray, that's what this is. This is a movie that was heavily, heavily edited by the studio post-assembly uh, cut. Not even assembly cut. Like, an actual cut of the movie that was like, hey, here is an interpretation of the Avengers. It feels like they gave an editor all of the scenes of the movie and just they were in a box and they said you have 48 hours to put these together to make a film and then this is what they came up with and there was a bunch of stuff they just couldn't find a home for right like cut out all the stuff that might make it sensible and entertaining and then let's see what we got I watched this with my wife and she pointed out that it reminded her a lot of Barry Levinson's Toys, the movie with Robin Williams and LL Cool J. And if you've never seen Toys with Robin Williams, you absolutely should. Then you should never, ever see it again. Yes. But it's got a lot of this fun house, topsy-turvy strangeness to it that if you're not watching it knowing that all of this is intentionally weird and going nowhere, you'll be questioning why is this so weird and where is it going the movie never is able to set a tone for itself and that's one of the big problems too like in the in the original series and they'll shut up about how good the uh, the actual show the Avengers is the thing that is so much fun about that show is that no matter how how dangerous a situation is the main characters are completely unflappable you know, they always look the, like they're slightly amused by it. And, you know, at least once or twice an episode, they'll cut to commercial with somebody pulling a gun on Patrick McNee or Diana Rigg or whoever. And the look on their face is like that half smile of like, oh, you've got one over on me for now. <laughs> That's what makes it so fun, though, because the characters are just so unabashedly cool. And also, here's another thing that uh, that kind of demonstrates the tone of the series. Like, there's an episode where Emma Peel gets tied to train tracks, but it's for one of those miniature trains like uh, they had on Silver Spoons where you sit on the engine. Right. And they play that old silent music, damsel on the train tracks music as Patrick McNee fights a guy on top of this miniature train. And it's this confluence of like, we're referencing these old silent movies, we're doing the damsel in distress, we got the music, and we're doing this action scene, and all of it's kind of ridiculous, but because of that ridiculousness, it's really entertaining and fun. Yeah, none of that happens in this movie. <laughs> right, there is one scene that gets close to it, but let's jump into this thing before I really go over the overboard on how much I love one scene of this movie. You pointed out that this movie is 89 minutes long, and five of those minutes are the closing credits credits so we're gonna chop that off sure and then there are three minutes of opening credits <laughs> yeah so that's 81 minutes total if you pull that out uh -huh. which is not shorter than the 78 minute runtime of it's path the movie season two episode three of pick six movies which has the shortest runtime of any film that we've done today yeah this is right up there with one of the shortest films we've done which which does recommend it to some degree i would argue this is better than it's pat but you can also make the argument that it's pat is kind of a movie where this is that is absolutely correct. I want to also say that these opening credits, longtime listeners will know how I feel about opening credits. I am passionately find them to be a horrible waste of time. Please don't make those as part of your film if you ever make a movie. One thing I will say about these opening credits is that we get a lot of time-lapse footage of like ominous clouds and lightning flashes against this fading swirl in of names. And it looks like the opening credits is kind of a mashup of if the Oompa Loompas sang a song about the hazards of bringing a corpse back to life. Or if 
somebody did their own Adobe After Effects version at home of the Doctor Who opening, but didn't really have a firm grip on the software just yet. It's real sci-fi, futuristic, meteorological. And then I saw the name Eddie Izzard, and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is going to be great. And then unfortunately, he's not in this movie, Bo. Yeah, Eddie Izzard, uh, who we both love, is in this movie about four minutes more than I am. I fully expected him to be the Otis to Sean Connery's Lex Luthor. Oh, if only. That's what I wanted. I was like, how do you not have this cross-dressing, incredibly brilliant and funny comedian not vamping it up a la Tim Curry? And And that's what I wanted. And you get nothing from him. He says two words in the whole movie. Yeah, as somebody known for being able to deliver a line and turn a phrase. By the way, what the the original show is famous for is its wordplay and sense of whimsy. Yeah, this movie doesn't have any of that, though. And we make the one character in this movie that could really sort of highlight that and certainly add a dash of flavor. And he is nothing in this movie. He is just henchman number one the the fact that they have a name for this character is overkill when the movie starts off we see john steed our primary the avenger as played by ray fines which but why is his first name pronounced rafe when it's spelled ralph well because he's british and fancy because ralph fines sounds real stupid but if it's like no it's pronounced rafe his whole life he's had that conversation oh no it's it's pronounced rafe ralph rafe yeah i feel like you're trying to say ralph no it's rafe hmm okay well everyone on earth pronounces it ralph i pronounce it rafe yeah it's a real igor igor situation It's like, I, I heard it was Ralph. Well, they're putting you on, weren't they? Why is this movie called The Avengers? I don't think they even use the words The Avengers in this movie, do they? The name of the show is kind of poorly titled as well, because the only time they ever talk about there being avenging in it is in the first like couple of episodes, which again, don't exist anymore. But the whole idea was that, oh, somebody got killed in this, in this drug crime. So John Steed and Dr. Ian and McIndry are going to avenge that death. But yeah, it's a bad title for the show. I would have called it, I say, oh chap, or rather. The title of the show should have been, Dear Me, A Murder. What's crazy is that that first Austin Powers movie came out in 97, the year before this came out. And that movie was a parody of this movie's source material in a roundabout way. And Austin Powers was more over the top and was more fun and goofy and wacky as this British, you know, secret agent spy spoof. This whole thing is just watered down and less fun and less suspenseful and less sexy than austin powers international man of mystery it's weird that austin powers is kind of the better version of the avengers on film (laughs) than the movie the avengers but you're right the character of austin powers if if instead of being a constantly horny kind of halfway sloppy sort of dude if you put him in the bowler hat and so forth and made him a little more prim and proper then you do have just the avengers because the rest of it is pretty dead on you're right like john steed rolls into this movie ray fines and wow. ralph fines and he's in a bowler hat he's got the umbrella it's very gentlemanly his, his attire as, as was uh, john mcnees from the original series dark pinstripe suit yeah and there's a moment where a flower pot falls when we first see him and he quickly steps out of the way and then leans down and he plucks a flower from the pot that's fallen pushes it into his lapel and then we get this insert that says john steed secret agent the ministry yes and so we know who our character is now except for the fact that there is no characterization ever in the film no (laughs) 80 percent of this movie no 90 percent of this movie is just atmosphere and muddled tone i'm gonna give what eight percent to plot slash things happening and about two percent is character development yes and as he walks down this street it's like a, a quaint little street in england Mm -hmm. cobblestones right you know there's always a sign over the door uh swinging like from an iron rod that's like with nail and per
church wheeze, mm-hmm. fine eggs, you know, that kind of shit. And he passes a constable, and the constable attacks him, and he flips him over one arm, and that, it turns out, knocks you out. Then, my favorite Chad is when he passes a milkman mm-hmm. who grabs two empty milk bottles and breaks them together like he's a redneck in a bar on a fighting Saturday night, and he's got yeah. a couple of bottles of Jaeger in hand. But he, <laughs> he knocks those together and comes at John Steed with his uh, jagged melee weapons. And Steed uses um, his umbrella to knock this guy out. And then there's an old lady who's pushing a baby carriage and she pulls out some knives and throws them at him and they just hit a door. So she's either a really poor shot or is just alerting the guys behind the door who all run out and then John Steed uh, fights these guys. Yeah. All of this fighting is a lot of hi-ya and judo chop. (laughs) And yeah, the action sequences are real stilted and that may just be because me as a modern day movie goer that you're kind of used to more rapid fire editing and better visual effects and stunt coordination and you know, if this scene is trying to replicate the low tech stunts from the 1960s well done 1998's the avengers well done indeed but if they were doing that and i think they are i think that's the point is like look how quaint this is but then you do it all the way through the movie and when we get to the end you don't have this highly choreographed sword fight Mm, yeah also real quick just to put a pin in it the old lady that threw the knives with the baby carriage we're gonna later find out that her name is alice yeah and she's gonna come back and visit our movie in about 45 minutes right but don't worry about it because eventually the movie will forget about her too (laughs) and (laughs) so then there's three nuns that pass by and you're like oh is he about to fight some nuns but he doesn't and then a car comes around and steve uses the handle of his umbrella to like hook a thing over this little tunnel and he lifts himself up as the car passes beneath him into a courtyard and then out comes a character named dr darling don't worry you don't need to know who that is and then john steed is like oh well the nuns were a nice surprise at first i thought are you talking about porn because that is a nice surprise (laughs) when they slip a nun into that for you but no it turns out that this is a staged test of sorts to keep john steed properly trained to deal with the various women with baby carriages and milkmen and flower pods <laughs> that he is going to come into contact with throughout the film is the job of all of these people to just get beat up by other secret agents in training are they like these mechanics and milkmen they were essentially secret agent jabronis i think they are either agents new to the program and they're well, like it's not a fair fight right we're just gonna have you dress up like a milkman and you're gonna get to meet one of our best agents agents and they're like oh well that sounds quite good you know yeah it is you're really gonna like it i think there's some guy up on a bell tower and he holds up a card that has the number nine on it and i guess he was grading steed's performance and i was thinking is nine good because if the scale is one to ten maybe that's pretty good if it's one to a hundred then he kind of sucks at his job unless the lower the number the better your score in which case the latter scale is better for scoring and more preferable i need context around the scoring system Bo. i think it's entirely subjective like diving scores where it's just like i don't know seven and a half i don't know how good that is how on earth would you tell it's just somebody jumping in water steed looks at uh dr darling and says you never can tell when the enemy will strike if we still have an enemy and dr darling says there's always an enemy you just have to know where to look and i'm like whoa this dr darling he's a war hawk uh-huh. he knows if you go looking for a fight you're likely to find one <laughs> and then before he leaves though he's like here it's a box of macaroons for mother and then takes <laughs> off and there's a great look that dr darling gives him where it's this real sideways like you kiss ass and pushes the cookies aside and then we actually meet mother who's a man right this is jim broadbent famous british actor jim broadbent i originally thought that he was the dude who played dr bombay on bewitched but then i looked him up and i was like oh he's professor slughorn from those harry potter movies and he was the dad in bridget jones and the bridget jones diary movies he was also the voice of santa claus in my favorite christmas movie arthur christmas which was the only thing i could hear in watching this film very famous famous actor uh seen in a bunch of stuff and he is the head of the ministry as the insert tells us elite intelligence Mm -hmm. and he has an assistant brenda who is a 
pretty what? lady. Who? Brenda. Carmen Aguillo, I think is her name. Uh, she's I been didn't in a even bunch see this character in the movie. Let's keep going. Except that she's <laughs> she's in the very last shot of this movie, weirdly. But anyway, he's looking at a monitor that's displaying all of England, and he's on the phone with the Prime Minister. He's always on the phone with the Prime Minister. But he's telling the Prime Minister, yes, uh, it seems the shields are down. Yes, that is bad. So apparently he's talking to Boris Johnson, who doesn't know shit about chat. And... <laughs> You know, yes, no, the the streets of London are flooded. Yes, that is a bad thing. Yes, you're a very good prime minister. So the Prospero weather shield is down. Put a thumbtack in Prospero because that'll come back. You can answer this question later uh-huh. in our conversation. Does this protect all of merry old England from weather? Is it a defense shield from more conventional weaponry? They don't really explain any of this. Let's circle back to that when it's explained to John Steed. Okay. We cut over to Uma Thurman, who is playing Emma Peel in this movie. Dr. Emma Peel. Which is a terrible choice of cast. This is one of the biggest problems with the movie is that one you got a a sasquatch of a woman in uma thurman to play how dare you she's lovely she's a beautiful woman i'm not saying that but she's also like six feet tall she could call her amazonian not sasquatchian all right let's call her amazonian then (laughs) but i'm just saying hey how about we get a british actress you know elizabeth hurley existed well she was in austin power she's not going to be in both these movies and she should have been like and again this is why austin powers is a better version of the avengers than the avengers <laughs> but she is kind of the emma peel character of this very capable sexy woman and uma thurman is the former chief of the prospero program weather shield program and there's this red cap that shows up at the door and hands her a package there's a note inside that says please answer your telephone and then her phone rings mm-hmm. it says you're going to die in seven <laughs> days and you're like, oh my god this is a prequel to ringu oh if only <laughs> interestingly chad now that you mention uh ringu there was a prequel to that movie called ringu rasen that delves into the science fiction underpinnings of of ringu and is awful is it worse than this movie no hey what year does this movie take place because her apartment is all decked out with andy warhol inspired paintings and it's furnished with all this 1960s and 1970s ultra swank home decor but there's computer technology from the 90s and all the cars are from the 40s and the 50s i don't know where i am or when i am it's a great question i think it's supposed to be the 60s but if that's the case like you said all the technology doesn't make sense so i don't know i the answer is i don't know chad and we're gonna that's gonna be a a refrain (laughs) for this episode of like there's no way to tell i don't know let me write that down mr spicoli (laughs) This voice on the phone says, Good morning, Dr. Peel. We've scheduled an appointment for you with John Steed at Boodle's Gentleman's Club. (laughs) A.K.A. the most racist place in England. Go on. Oh, my God. Dr. Emma Peel goes to this gentleman's club, and she rolls up in this light blue 1970s Jaguar E-Type. This is the car that the ambiguously gay duo's penis mobile was clearly based on, because this car looks like a dick with wheels. At least it does to me. The thing that was kind of fun, again, the... uh, I apologize for referencing the show upon which this is based, but it's really good. And Emma Peel was kind of known for driving sports cars. She drove sports cars and she drove them really fast. And Steed constantly had like his old Bentley that Mm -hmm. looked like it was from the 30s. And it was kind of a fun extension of their characters, right? Emma Peel was a little more freewheeling and dangerous and and John Steed was much more prim and uptight and mannered. So Emma Peel, a.k.a. Uma Thurman, rolls into Boodles and (laughs) There's a guy chasing after her who's like, there hasn't been a woman in this club since 1762. You can't go in there. You you have a vagina. (laughs) No women allowed. No women allowed. When you hear about these clubs, Bo, where no women were allowed, like in the 40s and 50s or whatever, doesn't this just kind of sound like a front for closeted gay men to live their lives without fear of judgment or repercussion from society? (laughs) Either that, or it's a place where prostitutes go to die violently, leaving no trace of their existence on Earth. If you'd like membership, here's our headmaster, Jeffrey Epstein. (laughs) 
she finally finds Steed after blowing some minds walking through the hall of Boodles as right. waiters drop their trays. Oh, lady. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of harumphing. And then she finds Steed in the middle of the steam room, naked, reading a newspaper. And you get a little bit of Ray mm-hmm. Fine's crack here, which is for the ladies. I thought he was sitting on the toilet taking a shit upon initial. And so there is some, in theory, witty back and forth it dares you to stay awake he's like oh i see you made it all the way here and she's like yes a test and he's like hmm there hasn't been a woman in boodle since and she finishes 1762 right it's all about like she breaks the rules he doesn't none of it matters because later in the movie he's like oh rules are made to be broken this boring back and forth ends with dr emma saying why did you wish to meet me and john Steele says i did it mother did and dr emma says mother and then john Steele says mother and it's like these two are gonna head up to the house behind the bates motel there's nothing suave or heroic or charming or likable about john Steele in this movie ralph fine's performance is just like flavorless warm yogurt he's got the creepy demeanor of your jared kushner's or your roll of bounty paper towels with google eyes stuck on it it's creepy and off-putting couple that with uma thurman who has a pretty shaky accent in this movie was she doing an accent yeah she's doing her british accent in this film and that doesn't go over well i thought it was like one of those weird madonna things where she just started talking that way in real life here's one of my favorite things of the modern era because lately the news is mostly bad but what we have come together as a culture and decided is that nobody gives a shit what madonna says anymore nobody gives a shit what celebrities say or do anymore yeah oh it's great chad if there is any upside to this nation's recent history it may just be that people are like yeah you were in a movie i bet you shut the fuck up about everything else (laughs) and when madonna is like oh i'm gonna do a youtube video or a tiktok or whatever the fuck she's doing about racism in america everybody's like you're a fucking 60 year old lady who what do we care nobody cares what madonna thinks about riots in the country go fuck yourself that to me says we're making progress as a people we cut to our two now riding around in this 1928 topless bentley and they're headed to the ministry to go see mother who is a man and upon entry they use this key card to allow entry into this highly guarded compound that turns out is underwater and i think it's beneath the thames river i'm guessing i don't know any other rivers in england so i'm gonna go with that let me ask you a question about this when they use the key card they put the key card in the car itself which seems counterintuitive because wouldn't the key card go in like a door that allowed the car in? Dude, we haven't even scratched the surface of the weird insanity that is this movie. So we go to this meeting with Mother, and uh-huh. then uh, Brenda lifts the shades, which gives us the view of the Thames, I think. Again, none of this is ever stated, so we don't know for sure, but it, it like you said, it's underwater. Uma Thurman says, I know about the Prospero incident, and this is where Steed is like, so what the fuck is this weather shield? Uma Thurman says something about tachyons or protons and neutrons or something, and then his summary of all of this is, someone attacks, put up the shield and everyone goes home for tea hmm (laughs) and you're like i guess that explains nothing about how this works or what it's supposed to do but i'm with you i suppose mother interjects yes all that's fine until someone blows up the research lab take a look at this video and then john Steele says we're going to have tea first right well of course again this feels like what the movie ought to be is like oh here's this big action sequence and then we just stop it to have tea that feels like a gag that would happen in the avengers but it, it, there's just not enough of this it needs to just lean into what it is so they're like well, you've got to work together they go and they have to watch this video to see who sabotaged the research facility uh-huh and it turns out that the person in the video doing all the sabotaging is dr emma Steele herself but in this case she's dressed up as black widow in this skin tight leather bodysuit she's got the red hair she's all decked out for comic-con mm-hmm. and she's the one who has infiltrated the defense system and did something what did she do it doesn't matter it's never explained then the real dr emma who's watching 
watching this says, it's not me, even though it looks like me. And then Mother, who is a man, says, yes, yeah, so go prove your innocence or something something and um, move along. So off they go to, to prove her innocence? Or something. <laughs> One of the things cut from this movie was there was a whole cold open to the film in which you see this Uma Thurman, spoilers, clone, go into the Prospero lab and steal shit and then beat up a bunch of people in Lee, which would have set the table for, oh, is Uma Thurman a villain or is she on the side of John Steed and the ministry? Gotcha. So there was a scene that would have established all of this. Yeah, and that makes sense because a little later there's a character that is presented as a good person but turns out to be working for the bad guys. So I could see where that would, yeah. So the character I'm talking about is Father, who also works for the ministry, but Father is actually a woman. And Father is played by Fiona Shaw, who was Harry Potter's mean aunt that locked him under the stairs, among many other roles in her career. And Father, who is a woman, comes in to talk to Mother, who is a man. And Father looks like she should be wandering around the Matrix. She's in this tight grayish blue pantsuit, and she's got these tight steampunk goggles and this really high and tight haircut. And Mother, who is a man, says, can we trust Dr. Emma Peel? And Father, who is a woman, says, it's all in my report, but Dr. Emma may have a split personality. I don't know why I have a gave her a German accent. And her husband was a test pilot who went down in the Amazon something, something, something in that scene. And none of that matters. Except that it makes it creepier when Ralph Fiennes hits on her later. Because she makes a point of uh, earlier on when he's like, oh, Dr. Emma Peel sounds so formal. Can I call you something else? And she's like, yes, you can call me Mrs. Peel. For the rest of the movie, he's just like, hmm, I plan to have sex with you. Which seems weird. So father is like, hey, I know I haven't given you this report yet, but I am sure she is a criminal. Also, she is sick in the head. And mother is like, well, I'm going to let her go because either she will lead us to the villains or the villains will find her. And his gag in this movie is sucking on a cigarette mm -hmm. uh, constantly. And the one detail I like is that his fingers are so nicotine stained that they're just yellow from knuckle to tip. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's gross. It is gross. And then we cut over to Peel and Steed fencing at a clothier's yeah. clothes store. Just, I guess they had fencing foils laying around. And more significantly, I think it's like, hey, in the original series, the introduction of Emma Peel is in a fencing scene. But they're just paying homage to that without actually making it make sense in the movie. It would be like if they were riding unicycles, you know, in, in a diner or something. Thing. none of this is, it's just bonkers Bo and we haven't gotten to the crazy shit yeah. this is all at least plausible you're like this seems a little off I don't understand this but it's at least something that could happen if I walked into a British men's tailor and there were two people upstairs fencing and then they came downstairs and they were still beating each other up with their swords I'd be like this is odd but it, it is explainable <laughs> we're about to cross a line that moves into a world of just sheer madness yes we are so close to the good stuff. Anyway, while they're fencing, Dr. Eva Peel is like, yes, we were firing ions or something at each other. And that's how we came up with Prospero. That does, you know what? I'm not going to ask. I know the answers. I don't know. Right. As they're fighting, John Steed asks her, what accounts for your overachievements? And she says, well, my father always clink, wanted a boy. Clink, 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 Perry. And Steed is like, huh, I failed to see uh, the sign significance. And she's like, hmm, I'm not surprised. So did my father. And there's all this back and forth where you're just like, this doesn't mean anything. And then Peel ends up winning their little duel. They go downstairs and Trubshaw is the name of the closiers. And so Trubshaw <laughs> has this suit for John Steed. And John Steed is like, oh, by the way, Dr. Emma Peel, I took the trouble of ordering you some boots. Gross. God, this is getting into Tarantino territory in a way I'm not comfortable <laughs> with. <laughs> Dude, I watched the first third of this movie the same way I pretend to be interested when I go to an art museum. Like, I go in and I'm like, all right, I'm going to give this a shot. And then I just start looking around and making up funny shit in my head that'll entertain myself. I'm hoping that there's some sort of a concession stand at the end where I can get a, something to drink, hopefully a beer. And I'm like, all right, well, I'm doing my time. I'm mm. bored as can be. And I don't give two craps about any of this. Right. And so then they leave the closiers. Uh-oh. And 
we get our first glimpse of henchman number one, Eddie Azard. Yes! Right! And he's just, like, in one of those newsies caps, uh -huh. chewing on a matchstick or something. You're like, oh, he's about to say something menacing. Nope! He just yeah. watches him fail to start a car for a second and then drive off. He's wearing a lot of eyeshadow and mascara for a street thug. Sure, but he was like, I brought this with me. You know, cake or death. <laughs> that is the whole scene. It's just, oh, the car won't start. I hope I'm not rusty. And there's some sexual innuendo that is in no way funny or entertaining or sexy between these two characters <laughs> where you're just like i haven't seen a lack of chemistry like this since the first semester of college in my class schedule it's like watching two 80 year olds at a retirement home hit on each other you've got very nice ankles oh i didn't know that you would notice <laughs> my compression socks are a little bit tight I like them that way. It's terrible. And so they're now on a drive and they're going out in the middle of nowhere. Like Emma Peel has no idea where they're going. No. She makes tea from this car dashboard and there's this whole like, mm, is it hot? Of course it is. Would you like sugar? No, I'll have lemon. And it's just the worst. Dude, the chemistry between Ralph Fiennes and Uma Thurman is on par with watching a six-year-old little girl play house with a Ken and Barbie doll. It is absent of any spark or energy or tension, sexual or otherwise. There was more romantic tension between Ray Fiennes and the Jewish girl that he kept threatening to kill in Schindler's List. Yes. <laughs> than in this movie, which is supposed to be kind of sexy. There's more sexual tension between a pack of gum and the keys in my pocket right now, Bo. <laughs> And so Steed says they're going to go pay a social visit to Sir August de Winter, <laughs> a former ministry head of special projects who is now retired and stupid rich. Oh, yes. And there's this whole <laughs> backstory about how his whole family, they were weather obsessed. They had names like May, June, and July, which let me just point out is being calendar obsessed. Yes. Not weather obsessed. <laughs> because if they were weather obsessed, they're names would be like misty and rain and humidity right something but months that ain't weather that's like if i <laughs> handed you a box of cookies and was like this is vegetables there are elements of that in this box you're <laughs> right. really gonna have to think about it <laughs> it's really stupid uma thurman is like so i take it he left the ministry under a cloud mm. <laughs> And it turns out the reason he got booted out was because he started saying that the weather was being affected by aliens, which is a thing that ought to show up later in this movie and never does. But I think that's funny. They enter this compound that is surrounded by a castle or a mansion or something. And Steve tells Emma, hey, you go inside and distract him with your female sexuality. And I'm going to wander around the grounds of this huge campus. And so Dr. Emma goes inside and there are these tables that are just covered in snow globes they're all over the place and then we get a shot of sean connery as de winter and he's playing a pipe organ and he's wearing this red plaid jacket and the camera pans up to see a painting of dr emma's very likeness Bo, this is never explained in the movie <laughs> as to why we see this painting of one of our three principal characters in this man's home i'm doing some fan fiction here some patented pick six f fan fiction in theory he has has been perpetually obsessed with her but no screen time is actually given to that notion but yeah i don't know man i don't know why it's there you know in dracula at least they pointed out that was it mina yeah. had the likeness of dracula's former wife and therefore that is why he was in love with her because they look so similar man you don't even have to get as classy as francis ford coppola's dracula the fucking movie fright night <laughs> <laughs> had a moment where when amanda bierce rolls into the house and jerry dandridge the vampire in that is like hey she looks a lot like her huh and his buddy his, his like gay roommate is like she does look like that woman that you were in love with hundreds of years ago and he's like i know right and that's it that's the last time you need to talk about it and it makes perfect sense. And this movie, whoever's editing this film, doesn't even have the good graces to be like, you know what? We're just going to whip a little Fright Night on this. They don't have to do that. Just show him playing the organ and then cut before you pan up. Right? Why? Yeah, why pan up to in the first place? Anyway. 
Dr. M is walking around this greenhouse and there are all these plants that are in cages with these large circular magnifying lenses in front of them, which makes each of the blooming flowers appear gigantic. And then Dr. Emma, she wanders around this botanical garden where it's drizzling rain. So she opens an umbrella and she says, hello, hello. And there's a crunch on the ground and something or someone is there. And it is at this time, the real star of our movie, Sean Connery shows up by wrapping his hand around Dr. Emma Peel's neck. And he's wearing a glorious toupee, let me say. You can really see that he and Burt Reynolds went to the same wiggest. <laughs> yeah. Connery puts his hand around this woman's neck in a very frightening way. I don't know that there's a, a non-frightening way to put your hand around a woman's neck. I've yet to discover it. And he says, Emma Peel, we share the same passion, I believe. And then he just starts kissing her knuckles. Which, bro, that's how you win a girl's heart. First you choke her for a few seconds, and then you smooch her on the hand. It's the Pepe Le Pew method of courting where you just terrorize a woman and kiss her appendages until she gives in <laughs> then he like whispers in her, in her ear he's like you know i've always admired women who are meteorologically inclined my nana used to name all of the clouds for me dude he starts naming clouds she starts naming the clouds and then he starts making orgasm noises like morticia adams suddenly broke into french while gomez was around he's just like oh she's like cumulus oh Nimbus, oh, stratocumulus. Oh. When she says cumulonimbus, he just blows a load in his pants. He then says, I discovered that nothing beats a good lashing. Take India, one can have a good 10 inches over there. And one should never have a fear of being wet. Um, come this way. <laughs> I think he might be coming on to her. <laughs> Her response is, hmm. And in that, hmm, you can hear, please stop alluding to sex for seven seconds, please. Tell you what, just string together three solid seconds where you don't talk about fucking me. I'll make you a deal. I'm not going to talk about sex, but here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to grab this towel and I'm going to dry you off from the waist down where no rain could have possibly gotten on you. <laughs> yeah. Spread your legs. I need to get inside your thigh. So he starts talking about this stone globe that's in, in, in this garden of his around all those cages of plants and whatnot. And she's asking him about like, hey, do you think there's a way to weaponize this weather machine thing that you were working on? And he just goes into this rant about, oh, there was a hot end of Cold War, you know. And she's like, oh, that's intriguing, but impossible. And he says, oh, it's not impossible, only mathematically improbable. Is that meant to sound smart? It sounds like the insane ramblings of a person who would be chained to their bed to prevent them from hurting themselves or others it's the ramblings of of someone with like late stage dementia <laughs> Uh, which I think is the problem with his character in this movie is he doesn't have a firm <laughs> grasp of what's happening around him. But then to illustrate his point about mathematically improbable, he starts showing her this plant that he created and he's like, oh, look, the stamen's not supposed to exist like this, but look at it. Touch it. Touch the plant. And Dr. Peel's like, I'm not touching you, Dick. Not since Dieter from Sprockets demanded that someone, Spankage the Monkey, <laughs> has someone been so insistent about touching something and she's just like eh, no it's look it's obvious you don't know anything and you're just a crazy old man and he's like don't know anything the ions and protons that was my doing and the micro transmission theory at the ministry all me baby micro trans what bo who knows and then as he's getting all worked up then there's a bell that rings and he's like oh tea time so they break for that which again is like the beginnings of a running gag but it ends here like if it happened more in the movie it would be all right but then it's yeah. just hey it, we're gonna stop all, all of this histrionics in the scene which is unfortunate because as you said sean connery is a hundred percent the best thing about this movie yeah and we're almost to the peak of the hill on the roller coaster that will be the back half of this movie that is full of so much weirdness and upside down twist and turns and unexplainable moments yes and we're really really close and so we cut to john steed who is snooping around the grounds and a red telephone box in the middle of this garden starts ringing and he's mm -hmm. like well, this seems unusual best go answer it then and hurricane force winds start blowing as he enters the box right and as he's in this box a voice is saying private property no trespassing mm -hmm. the white zone is for loading and un unloading only you can stop all this white zone business carol <laughs> i would love to see the british version of that <laughs> 
It's about the family business. I don't believe we're supposed to be talking about that. Cut back to Sean Connery and his toupee, and he's having tea with Dr. Emma in this greenhouse, and Connery says, Your friend is trespassing. So then let's just cut back to Steed, who now leaves the red phone booth. As it's snowing, it's snowing like it's fucking Narnia outside. There's a foot of snow on the ground, huge flakes are falling from the sky, and then a sled dog shows up, and the leather-clad mystery Dr. Peel, the one we saw on the surveillance video earlier, breaking into the super secret facility or whatever she was doing, she has shown up now driving a dog sled pulled by six huskies. Mm -hmm. And Steed thinks that it's the real Dr. Peel until the fake Dr. Peel tries to shoot him with a miniature harpoon gun and misses. So then she just pulls out this 357 Magnum and shoots him in the chest. (laughs) Yeah, end of movie, if only. That would be, (laughs) honestly, the only way to make this shorter would be to have John Steed dead right here and then you cut back to Sean Connery he's like well we wrapped that up pretty quick <laughs> so we cut to sometime in the future and the real Dr. Peel is nursing Steed back to health by feeding him grapes and through their dialogue we learn that the real Dr. Peel just found Steed out in the snow and that his waistcoat was bulletproof right. and that's why he's not dead right. bulletproof well, vest I love this freaking movie you know th- this is one of the first times in the movie you're like wait what is, what just happened so she left Sean Connery abruptly to go get John Steed who had been shot by her and then took him back to her place and we saw none of that no why would you so we just go to him waking up and rightfully he's just like the fuck just happened yeah and we get more british flirting which i find all of this completely intolerable there's a great moment where she's playing the piano and uh he's talking to her and then she just stops playing the piano and it turns out that it's a westworld piano that's just Uh playing itself and he's like oh you don't even know how to play piano you are quite deceptive dr peel and she's found a snow globe with an umbrella in it i thought she stole it well took it from sir august de winter's house right and on the bottom it says wonderland well, weather I didn't steal this i thought this was mine <laughs> britain is a colonial power after all i landed in india and thought hey this is mine now <laughs> The one clue they have is the manufacturer of this snow globe? Yeah. And so they're like, well, let's go to Wonderland Weather, which they do. Yes. And there, Steed asked the secretary of the place, I'm making my own roses, crimson flowers, and I need a certain kind of weather, and I'm un- in the understanding that you can provide that weather. And the secretary, much like the audience, is like, what the, f- what are you talking about? <laughs> what? What? When did you get an idea that, okay, um, then he's like, well, I'm part of the Brawley Institute. And she's like, I don't know what the fuck that is. And he's like, hmm, hmm. Uh, Sir August de Winter? And she's like, oh, I know him. Okay. The, the fi- guy with the toupee. <laughs> he looks like the bandit when he takes off his hat. Only older. We cut to the reason that this movie might have been okay once upon a time. Dude, you're just going to have to explain what's going on here. Because I sure as hell can't. We cut to a boardroom where everyone is dressed as a different colored teddy bear aka the first known existence of a furry convention yes this is the brawlies uh meeting and there's a black bear at the head of the table and it's every color of the rainbow it's vibrant yellows and blues and pinks and stuff like that they all look like they're on their way to support their local grateful dead tribute band (laughs) again as a a pseudo fan of the original adventure series it's like this is the kind of weird dumb shit that shows up in that show that makes it fun and where you just have like a bunch of criminal conspiracists dressed up as teddy bears and i'm down for a movie like that but sean connery uh, reveals that he is the black bear at the head of the table and he's like now you can know who i am but you can't know who each other are for reasons that defy logic so he says he demands absolute loyalty and absolute obedience and if they agree they're all gonna get a million dollars and then he says <laughs> so knowing nothing about our plan does anyone want to resign <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, and the yellow bear and the green bear, they kind of turn their giant oversized heads to one another and both stick their paws up in the air. Yeah. And there's like, it, like clearly this dude is out of his mind. I would have said I'm out of here when he told me to put the costume on before the board meeting started. Like, I'm not putting this on. Fuck that. This is a real Ernie Hudson movie where when a criminal mastermind asks you if you're in on his scheme, you say yes. You leave the meeting <laughs> and then you can waffle. But at the time, you're like, yeah, this sounds like a great plan. <laughs> when they say they want out, Connery throws two oversized tranquilizer darts, one at the yellow bear and one at the green bear. So they just keel over dead. Kathunk. And then we cut away from that, which is a shame because whatever's happening in this meeting, I'm down for. But we cut out of that to John Steed and Emma Peel with the secretary as they're kind of touring the facility. And you see these big glass globes with different weather happening inside them. And it kind of yep. confirms that the whole premise of this business is that they sell weather there. And wh okay. what you need is a radio transmitter and they can send weather through the phone line. What is their business plan? Like for agricultural purposes, for world domination? I mean, I get that that's the best and worst case scenario for anyone in 4-H, but I just want to know how they're planning to go to market with this. The problem is, Chad, that if you're running a business that sells weather, then why do you start to take the country hostage so you can sell them weather? Like you either that's what do I'm asking. You either do it the capitalist way or you do it the terrorist way and never the twain shall meet. But in this movie, we're just kind of throwing a little from column a a little from column b together let's see what happens the receptionist says i'm going to leave the movie now so you two can just wander around all facility so Steele and dr emma they make their way into the boardroom and the yellow bear and the green bear are just slumped over on the table so Steele and dr emma each take an oversized head off of the bear costumes and reveal that the two dead people inside are scientists who had once worked on science we then see all of the other bears just making their way about this facility like you would see next to the dumpster at a Chuck E. Cheese during shift change. There's just wandering bears in glass <laughs> elevators and, you know, walking down the hallway, just like, how you doing, Mike? How you doing, Jerry? Again, if this were the movie, I'm totally on board for it. But then it becomes one of those Spy Kids movies, which is fine, but that's having more fun with it. There's no fun in this movie. Right. There are no jokes that land. There's no real sense of levity or playfulness. It's so incredibly dry. It's like eating a sleeve of saltines every 10 minutes. Yeah, covered in cinnamon. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah so after they find these two dead bears that are it turns out are the head of prospero and his assistant we've got the bears leaving which we know as an audience one of them is sean connery in the black bear suit and then the other is the red bear and the red bear is going down black bear is going up okay so steed says hey dr emma peel you take the high road and i'll take the low road <laughs> so steed goes downstairs and finds a bunch of thugs on the ground floor in an alley led by eddie Izard, and you're like dude this is it this is where we're gonna get some full-on Izard. and they're throwing away a perfectly good bear costume but they're loading up this van eddie Izard confronts steed steals his hat and puts it on at a jaunty angle mm -hmm. and you're like oh shit here we go he looks like malcolm mcdowell in clockwork orange if everything white was black eddie Izard then just gets beat up like he steed is like you're going to regret doing that and then just beats them all up eddie azard gets away in this van and it's all really anticlimactic and then steed finds a piece of paper that turns out is a map with the logo for brawley which is short for british organization for lasting liquid years i got none of that i thought he found children's placemat from a long john silvers if it were a denny's kids menu it would be just <laughs> a significant costuming note eddie azard is wearing these fabulous high heel boots during this fight sequence i mean there are a good six inch heels on the base of them some things you can never change if you just let eddie azard i don't know speak in this movie it could be a lot of fun <laughs> yeah we <laughs> no. we cut up to the roof where uh dr emma peel is in pursuit of the black bear yes on the roof like among a bunch of ducks and whatnot and then like the australian drop bear chad the black bear jumps on dr emma steel and they fight and when dr emma peel punches the bear the head yep. comes off and it's not sean connery which don't make nope. no sense it's 
the duplicate of Dr. Emma Peel. Yeah, the mystery one that's always dressed up like Black Widow. Yes. While Dr. Emma Peel is like, oh my god, it's me. John Steed shows up and chases the Emma Peel bear off. And the bear, or Dr. Emma Peel in the bear outfit, just jumps off the roof. Of a skyscraper. Yeah. and To her death, right? <laughs> like, that's what's going to happen. Just, just disappears. It's a base jump, man. I mean, she's like one foot, two foot. Hoo! Right. As a member of the audience, I have to admit, Poof. I was like, so did she land on something? Did she tie a hose around herself like John McClane? Like, how did she survive this fall? And just like with everything in this movie, it's just like, I don't know. Uh, she's fine. <laughs> Emma Peel is like, oh, you were just in time to save me from myself. And you're like, oh, <laughs> just stop all of this. We cut over to the Ministry Mobile Headquarters, which is a classic London red double-decker bus. And inside, Mother, who is a man, and Father, who is a woman, they're arguing. And Steed is in the back, and he informs them that an organization is recruiting science scientists to do science stuff mother who is a man says you have your order steed the clock is ticking and i'm like what orders what clock what are we talking about here uh, who knows all we know is that the heads of the world organization on whatever are meeting on <laughs> that may be a quote from this movie <laughs> it could be they're meeting on saint swithin's day which is the patron saint of weather forecasting i thought that was something that was made up in a monty python sketch there's a george carlin line that features saint swithin's day and i thought he'd made it up until i watched this movie and i was like wait a second are these writers just george carlin fans or is that a thing and it turns out it's a thing and so mother who's a guy expects an attack on saint swithin's day what with all the weather forecasting and weather stuff that we do in this movie and john steed is like hmm i think all the prospero scientists are being recruited by brawley and we may have a suspect i like how there's no one in london other than the people in our movie like you never see anyone on the streets no other cars no one's walking around it's just the limited cast of this film yeah and you would think if you're doing like a period piece where this is the swinging in 60s or something or maybe the early 90s or right maybe it's the 20s that you would do a scene of them walking down the street and chit-chatting doing their verbal fencing and have like a glimpse of hey here's what life in london is like but there's none of that it's really this movie feels like it was made speaking of spy kids it feels like a robert rodriguez movie he made for about 30 bucks in his backyard like all those spy <laughs> kids sequels but then we cut over to the winter manor where sean connery tar targets a computer and then uh, hits a glass ball with lightning or something and then he just stops and says perfect dress rehearsal and you're like for what what just happened what did i just see <laughs> yeah it's just him hitting a button and a lightning bolt comes down and you're like well i guess something else is going to get zapped with lightning later maybe or probably not <laughs> Who's to say? Like, this is a movie that plays by its own rule. It, like you said, it, it's like an experimental film that dares you to redefine the very notion of narrative. At the end of it, they just ask the audience, what do you think that movie was about? And then you explain, and they're like, you're absolutely right. What did you think the movie was about? <laughs> I thought it was about this. You're right, too. The focus testing cards that came back were just question marks. <laughs> it's explained in the next scene that this is a weather bomb. Who explains this? Well, uh, Dr. Peel and then Steed's there. And these two are playing chess. And Dr. Emma, she's nowhere near the chessboard, but she's on top of the game. And they're knight to this and rook to that. And there's all this double entendre lace. Should we have sex in the future? Maybe not. But let's move this movie along with more exposition type conversations. Long story short, Sean Connery has a weather bomb and that's pretty much all you need to know right and they're like we should go back and visit sean connery that seems to be when this movie really steps it up <laughs> so then we get the big reveal of this movie question mark where which one father who is a lady who is a woman and sean connery are playing croquet yes and we learn that they're in cahoots oh i thought you were gonna say the big reveal is that she's blind well that's true too but you kind of saw that when you first meet her and she uses her hand reaches along the the guide rail of the stairs to suggest that she's blind i use the guide rail of a stair right but you don't like oh is there a guard the way she moved is she's too wearing suggestive. sunglasses indoors Bo. she's an asshole or she's blind and i went asshole they didn't do anything else she didn't mr magoo it a little bit you know like who said that who's there you're right but i went blind on this and it turned out i came up all sevens wait sean connery is playing croquet with a blind woman right who wants to fuck him as we learn 
And then he doubles the bet that they're making. Right. And she's blind. Yes. Yes. Because she's saying, like, you need to do something about (laughs) Dr. Emma Peel that she's sniffing around and getting too close to our grand scheme, I guess. And Sean Connery is just like, you know, I could never refuse you anything, father. Which is gross. Yeah. He's going to go have sex with this blind woman named Father. Like, he plays like he's being coy with her and whatnot, but he's also rolling his eyes like, if he is fucking her, it's totally totally a pity fuck more importantly he's just playing this old blind lady and like she hits the the ball the croquet ball i don't know the rules of croquet apparently you hit a stick with a ball and she hits her ball and it doesn't hit the stick and he's like oh very close again mother or father that's what he says every time she hits it right uh, she don't she know, know. <laughs> <laughs> she she could be hitting it into the pond nearby or whatever and he's like oh you're getting better and better father <laughs> he hits his ball and it hits the stick which i guess she trusts him because she can hear the ball hit the stick or whatever and he's like oh i win again and it's like no fucking shit it is a cruel thing to do to someone with a handicap and the fact that she's playing at all just means that she is in some great stage of denial where she's like, I can play croquet as good as anyone. And it's like, bull to the shit. They always tell me I do such a good job every time I hit it. I almost hit the stick. Oh, almost. that's a great painting, Father. She's not even <laughs> touching the canvas. <laughs> she's just painted a bunch of green scribbles on my wall. <laughs> oh, yes, Mother. You can drive a car. It's just like scent of a woman. Hop in, I'll tell you when you need to turn left. We cut to Dr. Emma and Steed, and they're riding around in her dickmobile. And they are being chased by giant robot hornets that can shoot bullets and launch rockets. Yes. <laughs> yes, and Eddie Azard has a basic remote control device that he's using uh-huh. to theoretically control these robot murder hornets. And the majority of these hornets, they just crash. <laughs> right, because he's trying to control like three dozen of them at the same time. And that seems woefully ineffective. <laughs> like two at best if you're ambidextrous and you're as smart as an eddie azard maybe you can do two at once otherwise you're just gonna blow them all up which is exactly what happens here <laughs> One of them barrels into the back of Emma Peel's car, and then Steed goes back there and, like, fishes the gun out of it and shoots down some of the other drones. Right. Then a bunch of them crash into trees, like the speeder bikes and Jedi. Yep. And then when Eddie Azard is like, well, this isn't going well, he just gets in a car and chases after him, which was probably what he should have done in the first place. Plan A. <laughs> murder hornets with rocket launchers yeah okay what's our plan b we chase them down in the car and shoot them with a gun Hmm. (laughs) plan c a tiny drop of arsenic each and every day (laughs) you'll never suspect it plan d iocane powder (laughs) plan f trick them onto a rocket ship and launch it into space and if all else fails put them in a bear suit chunk them off a skyscraper and we say that it was suicide it's utter nonsense and so as eddie Azard and his other henchmen chase after him in this car along with murder hornets then emma peel hits the last of the murder hornets which bounces over the top of her car and hits the windshield of the pursuing thug car which drives them off the road they should should be dead Bo. the way this car flips and tumbles and crashes but instead they just pop out and like and run off a real serpentine path and xylophone music plays then out pops uh the woman we will learn is alice the one that we saw at the beginning with the uh the the baby carriage or pram as they say in merry old england <laughs> she's just like uh would you be so kind as to get down John Steed and Emma Peel hit the deck and then she pulls out a Tommy gun and just shoots this thug that is behind behind a tree. Then she's like, I'm from mother. Who are you with? And Steed says, well, we're from both mother and father. It turns out that like mother and father are constantly at odds with one another and are, are, are fighting all the time about well, their mother and father. Right. Which is ugh. also Eddie is our, in, in his kinky boots. He runs away. <laughs> (laughs) He just hike and then runs off. (laughs) And then Alice says, We can bust into DeWinter's place 
I know a back way in. Yeah. But she really doesn't because we see a robot peacock that immediately opens its robot peacock eyes and is like, oh, hey, we're, <laughs> we've got more trespassing. And so they find themselves in a maze, which seems like the worst shortcut to get into this place. First, you go through a maze. Then uh, there's a minotaur. <laughs> they start finding their way through this maze and they're like, well, let's split up because that's the stupidest way to do this. They're like, let's split up and we'll all meet back in the middle. Right. Which what? Presumably is where the entrance is, question mark. And otherwise it's just like, you know, it's been a while since I've been in a hedge maze. When has this ever gone badly for anyone? Danny! <laughs> You know, you can take hedge mazes, those corn mazes, keep them all. I don't need that. That's just a waste of my time. <laughs> just walk through them. Just walk through the hedges. Nobody's looking. It's fine. No, I don't need to wander around and be confused. I do that almost every day of my life. Just contemplating my place in the universe. Yeah. I don't need help like that. It's like drinking games. I don't need help learning how to consume alcohol. I don't need ping pong balls and red solo cups. Just give me the booze. I got this covered. Every day is an existential nightmare for me so i yeah. don't need to add confusion as to my basic geography to that <laughs> so emma peel she immediately falls through the ground while john steed somehow runs into sean connery in this maze surprise surprise it's me and my toupee we're here to kick your ass <laughs> We're going to fight the Chicago way. Instead, they're using <laughs> Turkish rules, question mark. But I don't know what that means. I guess it means that Sean Connery is going to use a lightning bolt as his weapon. And then Steed's going to use an umbrella. So I highlighted a little bit of dialogue here to give listeners uh, who should never watch this movie a, a taste, a little sousant of what the dialogue is like. Where Sean Connery says, a man with an umbrella is a man praying for rain, Steed. And John Steed says, and a man without one is a fool. To which Sean Connery, as Sir August de Winter, replies, rain or shine, all is mine. <laughs> so all this rhyming nonsense is happening. <laughs> And then Sean Connery just pops John Steed's umbrella up into the air. Yep. At which point Sean Connery fucking disappears like a ghost. Correct. Just disappears. Steed looks around like, oh, he's disappeared when I was distracted by the floating umbrella. Mm -hmm. But then Steed, his face gets met with the elbow of the mysterious Dr. Emma, who's still in her Black Widow cosplay outfit. So she pops him a good one, and then he's out cold in that scene. Right. And then we cut from that to Uma Thurman, who apparently was kidnapped when she fell through the ground. Uh -huh. And is now strapped to a Goldfinger table. <laughs> Yep. Sorry, every time I say Goldfinger, I hear the trumpets. She's watching some kind of whirly disc, and Sean Connery just comes down and is like, oh, strapped to a table, you say. I've seen this type of thing before. And starts kind of undressing her, and he's like, all I've ever wanted is you. And you're like, when did this happen? How do you know each other? I've got a picture of you up above my organ, if you know what I mean. <laughs> organ? Do you know how to play the skin flute, lovely? <laughs> I promise you, you'll have a ball doing it. <laughs> I always leave a tip. <laughs> Careful, it looks like vain today. You're not going to get the shaft. <laughs> or maybe you will. This is my dick and I want you to touch it. <laughs> Was that too on the head? <laughs> so he keeps saying to her, when you wake up, you will remember nothing. Nothing. <laughs> Well, he gives her a little Cosby juice. He <laughs> injects her with something. Yeah, not since the what we do in the shadows brain scramblies has something been just so loosely defined. I don't know what's happening here. Why is he hypnotizing her? Has it happened before? Your guess is as good as mine. <laughs> We go back to the hedge maze and old lady Alice, she finds Steed knocked out. Is that why the mysterious Dr. Emma showed up to just clock him in the face and make him unconscious? Why didn't you just kill him? Feed his remains to dogs or sharks or wild pigs. Right. Let's get villainous here, Bo. Did Alice scare her off? Like none of, right. Uh, who knows? Why not? It's, it's the Seth Green, Austin Powers. Just shoot him. Shoot him. I've got a gun right here. Let's just shoot him in the face and we're done with this. Steed says, oh, I, I thought I was seeing double. And then old lady Alice says, you were a Gemini. 
And I'm like, wait, so you're, are you saying they're, that these two people are twins? That Because that's not what's going on at but, 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 all. Chad, we got another scene to do. Don't worry about that. So then right. we cut to Sean Connery and Dr. Emma Peel just dancing around while she's all dazed and whatnot. Where he's like, uh-huh. oh, you like this, don't you? Sure you do. This isn't weird. This is just dating. <laughs> she's conscious enough to stand up, but not conscious enough to know she should run screaming of her help. Yeah. And finally, she just passes out as he throws her onto a bed. And he's like, oh, well, I guess that's just an invitation to more stripping. And so he starts to unzip her top. And before he can kiss her like a perv. This is the second time we have seen a man with a mustache in a bad toupee undress an unconscious woman on a bed. <laughs> Yeah. And oddly enough, both of these two pays were made by the same wiggist. Yeah. Thursby's fine wiggery. If you're going to knock a woman unconscious and you're bald and you feel that you would like to hide your shame, come to us. We've got the types of wigs that will help you feel masculine as you violate a woman sexually and she'll have no memory of it. It turns out that the woman at the door is our old pal Alice who says, Oh, I'm here to sell some raffle tickets. What? That is her plan to get into this mansion? Where did she get the raffle tickets? They're in her hand, dude. These are just the absolute worst spies ever in the history of spydom. And when Connor is just like, how about you fuck off with your raffle tickets? And sh- starts to slam the door. She says, oh, I must insist. And then just pulls a gun on him. It's like, why even go through the charade of raffle tickets? Just pull a gun and be like, I need Dr. Emma Peel, please. Pull the gun, shoot him in the head. Go find Dr. Emma. You're on your merry way. Right. And, and also solution to our weather bomb problem. He's now dead. So we cut to Emma Peel waking up because we just leave at that point. By the way, don't worry about ever seeing Alice again. She's out of the movie. And No, she's got one more scene. She gets clocked in the head in just a moment. Oh, sure. But Dr. Emma's on the bed and she's saying, look, hey, wiggle your big toe. Wiggle that big toe. <laughs> right. Let's get these other piggies wiggling. And she eventually gets up on her own two feet, but she's totally drugged up. And she staggers around this room that is full of like well over 200 lit candles. It is a tinderbox ready to go up in flames. And then Dr. Emma, she makes her way over into an M.C. Escher painting where doors lead to hallways that lead back to the door she just entered. And I get that she's on drugs, but is this all in her head? Or does Sean Connery and his toupee live in a freaky mansion that's literally made out of magic i i think that straight up magic is now happening in this movie so he's a scientist who lives in a magic house look i've got my fingers in a lot of pies <laughs> and the reason we know it's the same room is that she takes this pallid bust of palace from the corner and just smashes it in the middle of the room and then goes out some stairs and comes back into the same room and she's like it's a madhouse a madhouse you know who's worthless in this movie steed he doesn't do anything he's just walking around the outside of the mansion with his umbrella tapping on the windows like tick 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 hello <laughs> are you in there didn't hear anything let's go to the next window tick 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 same question different window (laughs) moving along and emma peel does hear it at this point where she's like (laughs) is that a useless englishman tapping on a wall (laughs) and then just runs and jumps through this fucking mirror Uh uh-huh and lands outside on the ground She has no idea what floor she's even on in this mansion. This could be a leap to her death. And if she's not wearing an oversized black teddy bear outfit, there's a good chance she could die, though. Right. She's just assuming that the same physics apply to her as bears, apparently. Then inside, very quickly, we see Eddie Azard bring Alice with a sap. uh, Uh And then again, she leaves the movie. She thinks she just comes to after that head injury and she's just like, what the fuck? I'm getting out of this movie while no one's looking. Cheese it. (laughs) So at this point, it's time for Steed to repay the favor to Dr. Emma. And he brings her back to his flat where he's nursing her back to health. And she's apparently no worse for the wear. She's got no scratches on her having leapt out of a window. And when she hits the ground, she's like a good hundred feet away from this mansion. It's a pretty good distance that she jumps. But back at the apartment, Steed says, I've got you some new boots. And he unzips her boots which are red and he's like rubbing her calves and caressing her feet and then he's putting these new black boots on and it's kind of unnerving and creepy especially when steed starts talking about his own mom during this playful fuck talk between these work colleagues if there's a whole lot of like well i thought you believed in the rule steed oh i believe there's an exception that proves every rule as they're about to kiss 
father who's a lady and mother who's a guy bust in with a bunch of enforcers and uh-huh. they're going to arrest Dr. M. Appeal and mother is like, I'm so sorry, Steed. Nothing I can do. I have to arrest her and all. And they also say that, Steed, you've lost all access to everything. And they're like, father, you need to turn around. You're talking to the wall again. It's mother's assistant, Brenda, who tells Steed, there's nothing we can do about it. Father has taken control of the ministry. What? Right. <laughs> <laughs> then Steed is like, I've got one place to go, but I'm going to need clearance. And this is where Brenda is like, I will take care of that for you. Oh, yeah, yeah. I got that covered. Don't worry about it. I know she said you have no access to anything, but... Uh. Forget all of that, because no- nothing matters in this movie and nothing makes sense. So <laughs> we get a brief glimpse of a storm rolling into London where it's both snowing and there's lightning at the same time. It's the finale of Ghostbusters. (laughs) Right. Because we're just rocketing into the third act of the movie with no explanation of how we got here. Right. And so Steed is now in the Ministry archives, which are basically just the sewers. Uh Uh-huh. And who does he meet, Bo? The original John Steed himself, Patrick McNee, as Colonel I. Jones, or Invisible Jones. (laughs) He meets the Invisible Man. He does. It's a dude who was like experimenting he says with cloaking technology or something and there was a mishap and so we have oscar winning actor ray finds acting against a pipe on a string that is where we have come to it's beyond explanation it's a lot of like memoirs of an invisible man flashbacks of folders being passed between nothing and ray finds and back and forth and steed as this guy colonel invisible jones <laughs> <laughs> I, see, I found this map on the back of a children's menu. It's from a restaurant called Long John Silvers. Could you take a look and see if you might be able to help me figure out how this maze works? I'm having a dickens of a time getting through it. The Invisible Man says, Oh, the secret is you start at the exit and work your way backwards. Ha ha. Very good, old chap. And then Invisible Hand just crumple it up and like, I need you to focus, Steed. This means nothing. <laughs> You're a real idiot. We cut over and we see that the real Dr. Emma, she's in this padded room and she's rambling like a mad person about the existence of time and how people don't think logically. And she just sounds like a coked up philosophy grad student. Yeah, it's a whole lot of TikTok, TikTok. I guess we're going to talk about the weather. Everything goes back to the weather. It means nothing. This scene doesn't connect to anything else in the rest of the movie. Why do they have a giant sized padded room? Has she ever been in here before? Did they give her drugs before? beforehand to make her talk like this is she having some existential crisis because she saw a double of herself but she saw a double of herself on the roof earlier so why didn't she she have this thing right she saw a double of herself in a video footage i don't understand this scene whatsoever and it's just father kind of interrogating her finally when they get sick of listening to her talk evil uma just comes in the room with father and father sprays her with a knockout spray or whatever and just gets her to shut up yep and so steed then finds a a file on a ministry cloning project that was being run by sean connery what so he's into weather and he's into cloning things. right apparently the gemini project or whatever was run by sean connery and it was about cloning so that's why there are two umas question mark i mean again we are explaining this far better than the movie ever tries to yes also father who's a lady sold sean connery some ministry owned land that is an island in the middle of the thames mm-hmm. is ardberg is ardberg uh you know mr connery i thought it would just be a small little uh, is ardberg really just a ration like the fat pig you are Yes, sir. Yes, sir, Mr. Connery. I'll, I'll wipe that off. Miss Teschmacher! <laughs> oh, wait. We don't have a Teschmacher. That's a real oversight in this movie. I could use a large-breasted lady that we throw in a pool. So then they have a council of ministers meeting, an emergency session. Harum, 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 harum. And Mother is watching this on his video screens. When Sean Connery just rolls into the room along with his toupee. He's all kilted up and he starts with, and now is the winter of your discontent. That's not how that quote goes. Shut up! <laughs> no, it's because my name is DeWinter. It's a whole thing I'm doing. Wait, who who are you? Yeah, this movie thinks it's a million times smarter than it really is. 
I'll tell you who I am. I'm the guy who was making Shakespeare references a little bit earlier that went all over your uneducated heads, you dimwitch. Is he the caterer? Are we having haggis? I had haggis yesterday, and it did not agree with me. No, I am not the caterer. Yeah, I'm controlling all the weather. And he says, I've set off a chain reaction that's going to destroy the city. And now oh. you're going to have to buy your weather for me. And by oh, God, God, you're going to pay for it. Hundreds of millions of people are going to drown. They're going to burn and freeze. Some are going to melt or combust, disintegrate. Some of them are going to get thrown through the air by the wind. Some of them are going to have rain fall down on them. And they're going to get really, really wet. They might slip in the rain and break a hip. Or they might choke to death using a belt to cut off oxygen to heighten self-pleasure. Has nothing to do with the weather, but once I make them stay inside, they got nothing better to do than jerk off. Rates of pneumonia and suicide are gonna skyrocket. I own stock in Netflix. This actually sounds like a pretty good deal. If we could really find a way to get everyone to stay in their homes. Hey, I've got a... I've, you and I need to talk later. I just came back from Wuhan. Don't make me use one of my lapel swords. <laughs> I'll use it on a teddy bear. I'll sure as hell use it on you. <laughs> he tells them, you got no choice. You're going to have to buy your weather from me. What is he talking? We have to buy weather from him? And you have until midnight to make your decision. What decision does he want us to make? And then, oh yeah, Alice comes back into our movie. Oh, she yeah. She wanders in to where Mother, <laughs> forgot about that. She comes in to Mother, who is a man, and she says, here's this envelope that I found laying on me. My dress was up around my ankles. <laughs> it smelled like Sean Connery. But anyway, these are his demands. And Sean Connery wants 10% of the gross national product annually and a lifetime supply of wig combs. Yeah. Mother asks, did he have to torture you, Alice? And, and she's like, he didn't have to. He knew everything already and also i told him well she says father you know the one who's a woman the blind lady she's working for sean connery and his toupee and then mother who is a man says we must stop him i mean her i mean them and at this point we get a big reveal that mother who is a man is in a wheelchair when did that happen yeah i've always just thought he was sitting down before but it turns out yes. he's he's a handicapped fella in a wheelchair. <laughs> and so then we leave that to cut over to father, who's a lady, and evil Dr. Peel carrying the real Dr. Peel through the snow. And she's all passed out. And mother wheels out in his wheelchair and pulls a gun. Into the snow. Into the snow. Pulls a gun on father. And he's like, I demand you release Dr. Peel. And <laughs> mother, who's a guy, is like, which one? And mother... Mother is so flabbergasted by this that father, who is blind theoretically, gets the drop on him. Right. And takes his gun and is like, I guess it isn't Mother's Day, is it? And you're like, ugh, just <laughs> knock it off. Like, if that's the best you got, keep it. I just want to circle back. Sean Connery wants 10% of the gross national product annually from all of these countries. Does that seem like a weird demand from a supervillain in a movie like this? I mean, it's very specific. And it should just be like, why are we doing GDP ratios here? <laughs> it should just be like the, uh, again, Austin Powers, like it's a billion dollars. I want 10% of the gross national product, but that all depends on how the stock market performs. If we were to see that there would be any sort of fluctuation that would be outside of 8% of the standard deviation, then we're going to have to renegotiate our terms or else you don't get your weather. Also, if anyone starts levying tariffs, the whole deal is off. So John Steen wakes up in this empty padded room. I remember how he got there. And he's checking his watch, which is really, it turns out, a tracer <laughs> sure. that links him to the good Uma. And so he's just like, well, got to go and takes off running. He does nothing in this movie. How did he get he knocked did... out again? What happened? Because the last time we saw him, he was finding out about the island. And Steed is talking to the Invisible Man, yeah. and they say that the island is where all of the weather is being controlled from, which is in downtown London. Right. So then Steed runs off, and he makes his way into the steam tunnels under the city, and that's where he ends up going into the padded room, and she's gone. That's when he pops out his pocket watch, which is also a tracking device that we're later going to find out is honing in on a chip that he put inside of her set of kinky boots. Gotcha. And so... So yeah. the good Uma wakes up 
as she's flying over London in a dirigible, uh, in a hot air balloon, while yes. father and evil Uma... Is father in the hot air balloon, said the man who watched this movie twice and tried to answer this question on his yes, own? Yes, yes, she is okay. in there, and they're okay. so busy piloting this hot air balloon that the good Dr. Peel is just like, time for me to 83 skidoo, and then just <laughs> takes off. Uh-huh. And John Steed finds mother in the alley who laying in the snow and just chain wheelchair smoking. turned over. Yeah. He's smoking. Of course. I really appreciate the fact that he's just like, well, I guess I'm just going to die in the snow time for another cigarette. You know what? I will have one of those Chesterfields. He tells John Steed, like you have to go after a balloon and John Steed's like, okay. All right, fine. Whatever. I'm look, I'm just trying to get to the end of this thing. I don't really care anymore. We cut back to the balloon and the good Dr. Emma, she's up on top of the balloon and she starts yanking out hoses and tubes, the thing what makes it fly up in the air. And then the evil Dr. Emma, she climbs up there and these two start slapping each other around. And we can hear on the radio that Sean Connery and his toupee are screaming about how the balloon is off course. And Steed does nothing but just sort of wander around on the ground in the snow watching this balloon up in the air. And then the balloon crashes into an oversized statue of somebody and this collision causes the real dr emma to tumble off and fall to the ground below where she would most likely die of blunt force trauma but in this case she's fine she landed on the ground she's gonna be okay right and then the balloon crashes into the neon rainbow sign for wonderland weather which explodes in a fireball killing the mysterious dr emma in her leather bodysuit and i'm guessing father was on there according to Bo. and the whole scene really feels like a tragic interpretation of the finale of the original muppet movie but with less paul williams ballads so father is gone now as is evil uma okay and then john steed finds dr emma peel unconscious in the snow and wakes her up and to make sure that she's the real emma peel he just kisses this married woman boy and the sparks don't fly do they (laughs) yeah and he's like that was for scientific purposes i was looking for hard evidence that you were the real mrs peel Mm. don't dick around with me (laughs) Uh, (laughs) you've got me quite emotionally erect she says well are you convinced and he says i'm still thinking Mm. (laughs) it's just the worst roll credits the movie's over he saved her we're done nope nope because we cut back over to mother who has found his way back into his office or whatever how did that happen he just flipped over his chair clawed himself up into it in the snow and rolled himself inside just for the record for as much as we're bitching about like mother and father and all this stupid bullshit none of that is in the television show there is no like none of this ministry bullshit every episode is it's just like, hey, we're here to investigate this thing. Who sent us? Who cares? We're here to have a good time. Mother is telling the prime minister that, uh, like, everything's under control. We've got top people working on this. Who? Top people. We cut to this tiny island that's out in the middle of a river. And it turns out that this sits atop the secret lair of our villain in the... F- and then we see Steed and Dr. Emma walking across the water in these giant hamster balls that float on the water. And snow is everywhere. It's pouring from the sky. And Sean Connery and his toupee, they are surveilling them on TV monitors. And he's waiting for them as they approach. And they're like, how are we going to get in here? And Dr. Emma Peel is like, don't worry worry i know the password how doesn't matter i know it but she does she says how now brown cow and they're in yeah there's a secret entrance way inside yet another bright red telephone booth like one would find in london circa 1941 or 1968 or 1996 doesn't matter I know. Uma Thurman, as Dr. Uma Peel says, like, I'm going to go try to disable this machine. John Steed, you go get Sean Connery. Sean Connery and his toupee, they see that an intruder is coming in, which is Dr. Emma. And Sean Connery says, Bailey, take her. And I'm like, what is a Bailey? <laughs> yeah, that it turns out is Eddie Azard's name in this movie. The first time it's mentioned. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Eddie Azard and Sean Connery and his toupee, they don't even share screen time with one another in this film. No, they don't. I, that could have been done without Sean Connery in the room. <laughs> and, 
Eddie Azard goes to after Uma Thurman. Sean Connery says he's going to take care of John Steed. And we see uh, uh, John Steed in this big circular stairwell. All the windows blow in and he protects himself with his umbrella, kind of. Dude, when Sean Connery hits that button and all the windows blow in, it is a waterfall of broken glass that pours down on him. And his umbrella only helps him for a few seconds. And then he just gets showered with glass shards. There is no way that you would be able to to escape this type of assault without just being covered in lacerations to the point of immobility it's impossible it's yes. like that scene from flash dance where the water pours over her but in this case it's a pasty white british guy and instead of water it's just a ton of glass shards yeah it's johnny glass rain here it comes right here in this bag <laughs> and so while he's getting doused by glass <laughs> Dr. Emma Peel is walking this metal tight wire to the machine suspended above, I don't know, water or something. Yeah, it's a big silver globe that's running the weather doomsday device. Right. And so Bailey, a.k.a. Eddie Azard, appears and kind of hooks himself to one of these high wires. And then... Uh-huh, so he don't fall. <laughs> and Dr. Emma Peel didn't think of this. So they're just fighting on these wires. My favorite part of this is uh, Eddie Azard just grabs one of the wires and then shakes it up and down to knock her off yes. of it which is pretty cool it's a pretty spectacular fight it's pretty good between these two yeah they're kind of weaving around all these wires and stuff and then finally dr emma peel gets the upper, upper hand and she starts bouncing one of the wires herself after she saw his trick yeah i'm gonna do that right like yeah what's good for the goose is good for the eddie azard <laughs> one end of it breaks so eddie azard swings to the wall like slams in the wall like wily e. coyote yep and Eddie Azard, known for his ability to deliver lines comedically, then says, oh, fuck, and then falls to his death. Bo, it's a pretty good fight, if I must say. But I wanted to ask you, are you in the mood for a quiz? Because, Bo, I've got a quiz for you. I know it's the end of our first episode of our 12th season, but the people love the quizzes. They're always seeing me on the street and they're saying, Chad, what we want more of in an episode of Pick 6 Movies is a quiz. So, Bo, what I am going to do you is a quiz where you, Bo Ransdell, will determine once and for all what is the greatest movie fight of all time. I will give you two fights in cinema. You will select which one is the superior at which point I will give you another fight in cinema and you can select your original choice or determine that the new fight is better than your previous one, thereby crowning a new victor. When we get to the end of this list, you, Bo Ransdell, will have determined the greatest fight in movie history ever. This sounds like science that cannot be disputed. I could not be more excited to be part of it. Here we go. The Avengers, Dr. Emma versus Eddie Azard in his high-heeled boots, or Empire Strikes Back, Luke Skywalker, versus Darth Vader. You know, all of those Star Wars fights are kind of shitty when you get right down to it. I'm going to go Avengers here. Okay. Avengers versus The Princess Bride, Wesley and Inigo Montoya. Wesley and Inigo Montoya. That's pretty great. Princess Bride over The Wizard of Oz, Flying Monkeys versus Scarecrow. Uh, I love a flying monkey as much as anybody. It's not really a great fight, though, so I'm sticking with Princess Bride. Princess Bride against Superman 3, Superman versus Clark Kent. Still going Princess Bride. Princess Bride against the firm Wilford Brimley v. Tom Cruise. Oh, man, that's not very long, but that's real fucking good. I gotta go firm on this one, shit. I, my Wilford Brimley love knows no bounds. The Firm against Million Dollar Baby, Hillary Swank v. That Stool. <laughs> oh man, that is good. I, I'm still going Brimley. The Firm against Aliens, Ripley v. Alien. The, like the Queen Alien at the end? Yes. Oh man, I, I gotta go with that because she burns all of the Queen's babies to piss her off. Aliens against Evil Dead 2, Ash v. His Hand. Oh, Ash v. His Hand. Evil Dead 2 against Freddy vs. Jason, Freddy v. Jason. Ash v. His Hand. There's a clear winner in that. Evil Dead 2 against Sin City, Marv vs. Kevin. That's pretty good. I'm still going Evil Dead 2. Evil Dead 2 against Roadhouse, Patrick Swayze v. Jimmy. Uh, Evil Dead 2. Evil Dead 2 against Karate Kid, Ralph Macchio v. That Blonde Asshole. Uh, Karate Kid 2. Karate Kid against Lethal Weapon, Gary Busey v. Mel Gibson. Oh, man. Lethal Weapon. Seeing Gary Busey beat the shit out of Mel Gibson is a delight. Lethal Weapon against Raiders of the Lost Ark, Indiana Jones v. That guy what got chopped up by the plane propeller. 
I'm sticking with Lethal Weapon on this one. I like seeing races get the shit kicked out of them. <laughs> lethal Weapon against They Live, Rowdy Roddy Piper v. Keith David. Man, now you're right in the high country. It, they Live. They Live against Kill Bill Volume 1, Uma Thurman versus The Crazy 88. Ooh, man, that's tough. Uh, Kill Bill. Kill Bill Volume 1 against Cool Hand Luke, Paul Newman v. George Kennedy. Uh, Kill Bill. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Kill Bill Volume 1, Uma Thurman versus the Crazy 88s is the greatest fight in cinematic history. Uh, you know, if that were a legit list, I can live with that. You know, right. that ranks Wil Wilford Brimley high. That uh, certainly does credit to Evil Dead 2. And also, of course, Uma Thurman and the Crazy 88s, which is genuinely one of the best fight scenes in, in movie history. <laughs> Our winter storm is growing in intensity outside. So we see lots of miniatures getting blown around, including double-decker buses, and windows are getting blown out into buildings. Steve makes his way to the command center of all of this mayhem, which it turns out is just a big glass globe sitting above a body of water. It looks like a water treatment facility, if you ask me. Yeah, they're on a gangplank, kind of fighting, like Sean Connery has to come down to meet Steed. Uh, Steed has a sword in his umbrella, and Sean Connery is like, oh, well, that's pretty sneaky, Steve steed but how about this and then you know tosses knives at him that steed stops with uh his hat and then the two sword fight for a while as water rages around them and lightning is striking it blows up big ben and then we see a countdown clock that says three minutes and counting i'm like three minutes to what 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 are we worried about that's gonna happen i think three minutes to midnight maybe and then everybody I dies know. I, who knows and like uma thurman is just yanking shit out of this thing isn't he waiting for a decision about the gdp from all of the world banks and nations well, he, he also said in his note, if anyone tries to fuck with me, the deal's off and I'm just going to blow the shit out of everything anyway. They're chasing each other up and down these gangplanks and then it kind of unceremoniously ends with John Steed getting this pole that Sean Connery, I was using my pole to fight, that Sean Connery's been using and just kind of runs him through with it. Yeah, but it's a lightning rod and then lightning strikes and then when it hits the pole inside Sean Connery's body, the lightning kind of like one of those Ghostbuster guns sort of picks him up and sucks him up into the sky. It, not like Ghostbusters, Chad. It sucks him up into the heavens like powder. <laughs> It's like he was a pale albino gay boy what got taken up by the angels and lightning. And sure, yeah, and he's just gone. And we see uh, some CGI tornadoes uh, wrecking London. And then uh, Dr. Emma Peel pulls a wire and the weather machine shuts down. Yeah, she's just yanking on, how about this one? Nope. How about this one? Nope. How about this one? Hey, I did it, everybody. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. At least with Armageddon, it was like red wire, blue wire, red wire, blue wire. Hopefully it's the blue wire. In this one, it's just like <laughs> unplug. Nope. Unplug. Yep. And we're done. We're good. And she dives off the machine into the water. John Seed helps her out. And she's like, what kept you? And he says, hmm, the weather. <laughs> uh there's a self-destruct mechanism that goes off and these two climb inside the glass globe that was the command center and it's big enough for about two people to fit in and then the island where all of this is taking place in the middle of the thames river or wherever it is it blows up like apocalypse now yeah. it is a rain of hellfire of melting and destroying everything so you're like well i guess our heroes are dead which is then immediately confirmed by mother who is a man who is on the phone with the prime minister i guess that's all he ever talks to and he's like oh yes two casualties hold on i need to get another cigarette yes two casualties in saving london from all the killer weather Yes, they're definitely, definitely dead. Then we cut back to the river and the globe pops out of the water and Steed and Dr. Emmer are inside. And my question to you, Bo, is how much time passed from the moment of the explosion to Mother, who is a man calling the Prime Minister, saying two people are dead, to the time that they popped out of the water? Like a day, an hour, a month, a year? Yeah, I mean, Mother at one point says like, hey, I'm going to send out a search party and then doesn't. And, or if he does, it yields nothing because directly at the point where they disappeared is where they have been, apparently. Anyway, I, I don't know. I don't know, man. I don't know how long they were gone. I just know they're back. 
Yep. And then we cut to the final scene of our film, which is days, weeks, months, years later. Steed, Dr. Peel, and Mother are all on this gazebo on top of some building somewhere. And they're drinking champagne and they eat a macaroon. The end. Yeah, that's right. We're done. Yeah. Thank God. Yeah, that's it. That is the blockbuster film. <laughs> The Avengers. You know, it's really interesting when you go back and you look at the history of blockbuster films that were put out by different studios. And this is not a very good movie at all. And it really tanked badly. And you see sort of what movies were doing well at this point and what movies weren't. And this was one that, that really wasn't doing well. Warner Brothers in 1997 put out Batman and Robin, which pretty much killed that franchise, you know, until Nolan showed up again. In 1998, we got the Avengers, which as we've just found out, is absolutely terrible. But in 1999, Warner Brothers came out and completely turned things around with a movie called Wild Wild West. Oh, Chad. Which, Bo, I don't know if you know it or not, but that movie was also based on a TV show. I was aware of that. It starred Will Smith and Kevin Klein, Kenneth Branagh. It was directed by Barry Sonnenfeld, who did those Adams Family adaptations, and he made the Men in Black movies. But what could possibly go wrong with that film? I mean, nothing. It sounds like a crowd pleaser. Which brings us to episode two of this season of Pick 6 Movies, which will feature Wild Wild West, starring the aforementioned actors, directed by the aforementioned director, and clearly not delivering anything that resembles a motion picture that could be defined as successful. I, for one, uh, have not watched that movie in many, many years and, and can't imagine how it, it has held up even remotely well. There's no way it has. For me, the thing I remember most is Cartman on South Park with Clyde Frog and him walking around doing hand puppets referencing the film. And if those guys are jumping all over it, you know it's got to be a real turd. <laughs> yeah, this is the movie that very, or somewhat famously, Kevin Smith uh, referred to in one of his monologue specials for the giant spider that appears for no good reason in. And it's funny because on its surface, a sci-fi Western mashup based on an existing property starring arguably one of the biggest movie stars of the 1990s being directed by the person who, you know, shepherded him through the Men in Black film should have been a slam dunk, but it is not. We will be discussing that in two weeks time. But any final thoughts that you have on the Avengers? Yeah, if you're at all interested in kind of a slightly goofy kind of cool and stylish version of this uh watch the original series you can get the uh seasons I, I think all the seasons after season two are available on amazon for like 10 bucks for 20 episodes for each season so i did that very thing i bought myself a couple of seasons of this and have been picking at it here and there and, and they're a delight i i can't recommend those enough i i can't recommend you don't watch this movie enough <laughs> But the original series, very good. Very nice. As always, like, rate, review, tell a friend, send us an email if you want us to uh, to give a little feedback or tell us what you like or what you don't like. Mostly what you like, but well, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll read them all. You can reach us at picksixmovies at gmail.com. You can find us online. We're floating around on social media. And uh, we will look forward to seeing you in two weeks time with a major blockbuster that wasn't with the Wild Wild West. Wild Wild West. Deep in your deep wild wild west <laughs> oh my god I like a movie that has a theme song <laughs> thanks everybody <laughs> <laughs>